Start by stating the obvious. With human intelligence staying roughly the same and AI getting better by the day, it is only a matter of time before AI outperforms us in all domains. Building this level of AI is the explicit goal of frontier labs like OpenAI, Google DeepMind, and more recently, Meta. The first major implication of smarter than human AI is for public safety due to the weaponization and control problems. The weaponization problem is straightforward. If a human being can design or use weapons of mass destruction, then a smarter than human AI system can too. The control problem comes from the fact that a system that is smarter than us is by definition one that can outcompete us. Which means that if an advanced AI system, through accident or poor design, starts to interpret human beings as a threat and take actions against us, we will not be able to stop it. This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Another fascinating presentation on this bill. Um, if, I, if I could start perhaps with Mr. Bailey and Mr. Lale? Lallier. Monsieur Lallier. So on the one hand, we've got this issue where we've got, you know, it's just advanced math. And on the other, your presentation, don't worry about the fear. On the other hand, you also said don't worry about the fear, but it could end a humanity within two to five years if it becomes smarter than uh, us, which you're saying it, it will. So it's pretty hard for us to juxtapose uh, those two uh, issues. So perhaps, Mr. Bailey, you could start first and then the Mr. L.A. to say, how do we, how do we balance that? Because I also, uh, contrary to perhaps one of the witnesses, I have a problem with a bill uh, that uh, removes Parliament from uh, setting the legislated framework about the limits on any, any part of our public policy, which this bill does. So, uh, oh, okay. Um, yes, so the, the um, working in, in Canadian AI as I do, um, I speak to experts who are assessing these various claims. Um, most are um, of the, there's a consensus that, that uh, this sort of world ending risk is maybe 20 years out, maybe 30 years out, something like that, that we have time to regulate these things now. Um, but I would say that, you know, my focus in, in, in the remarks that I made is that we have a choice between whether we want foreign companies to be deciding this or we want Canadian companies to be playing along. One of the concerns is that what some of the uh, regimes that have been proposed right now sort of lock in the current state, um, which obviously Canada is not a big player. So we can go and write laws if we like. Um, are they going to be followed? Are we going to be able to enforce them? This is the thing. So the, the, the power that we can give ourselves is, is the opportunity opportunity for, you know, for example, one important aspect, we talk a lot about chat GPT, but there are now hundreds of lang large language models that are open source. Um, these are by people and companies that don't necessarily have the regulatory department to deal with the, uh, you know, the regulations that are maybe being proposed in some corners. So, that's <clears throat> absolutely. Um, I, I, would, I think there's not necessarily a contradiction between our positions. Um, the purpose of this bill is to make sure that the good types of AI, the beneficial ones, the ones that are harmless, are developed and are and at kind of leading in that. <clears throat> On the timelines piece, uh, I mean, look, uh, nobody can predict the future, but I mean, the reason I, the people think it's, or many people think it's, it's short term is because if you look at the trends, whether it be the amount of compute going to the algorithms, the amount of data going to the algorithms, the amount of the efficiency of the algorithms, the amount of money going to the space, all these trends are exponential. The amount of incidents reported, like, as everything is doing this, right? Which is, I mean, if you remember COVID, for the longest time it starts with nothing and then all of a sudden it's something, right? Um, that scenario is entirely possible with AI, where we go from, you know, not much AI to machine learning to generative AI to something at human level relatively quickly. Very unintuitive, but quite possible. And that's what we have to be ready for. Um, the minister proposed uh, amendments, we said at the beginning of this process, more than 500 days ago, someone said almost two years ago when the minister did this, that this was both on the privacy side, on the AI side, a flawed bill. Uh, we've had a lot of witnesses on the AI side say it's a very flawed bill. Well, many want us just to defeat it and start all over again. But this bill started with uh, uh, an attempt to basically just control uh, what was called high-impact systems. The minister's amendment introduces two new levels of control, one being machine learning in the legislation, the other being general purposes to me, which seems like just about everything that would come in AI, um, and gives the minister total regulatory power to oversee them, find them, police them, all of that. So on the schedule, on the back of the high-impact system, so one, so first, 
do you agree that now almost everything is covered with the minister's proposed amendment because they put general purpose AI uh, and machine learning in as well? And two, do you agree with the definition of high impact that is attached in schedule uh, for the minister's amendment? Uh, talk, uh, Mr. Bailey first. Okay. Um, so the, the, uh, from the perspective of, of business, there's really two aspects to this regulation. I, I want you to understand whether it's in the U.S. or the EU or here in Canada. There's sort of the infrastructure piece. We need to put in place an infrastructure with a commissioner and, and uh, you know, have, understand who's going to do what. And then there's the actual rules themselves. And as one of the witnesses has said here this morning, like, as things progress quickly, nobody really knows what the rules should be. Nobody's agreed, whether it's in the U.S. or the EU even, for that matter, you know, what the rules should be. But we should definitely be in a hurry to get um, a, uh, an infrastructure in place. Specifically on whether I agree with the definitions, I'm going to defer on that and say that I'm not an expert in drafting legislation. But what I am an expert in is that Canadian businesses need to be able to read it and understand it. And that as legislators, if we don't understand uh, you know, what it means. Like, we shouldn't abandon our, you know, tradition of understanding the laws that we're writing. Um, yeah, so specifically to the, to the definition of high impact, it is, the Minister's Amendments are a very significant step in the right direction um, by the, including basically general purpose systems is very good. For the particular schedule, one, our main recommendation is to include not just use cases, but also capacities, because a lot of these capacities, especially things like autonomous self-improvement um, or self-exfiltration, and I can go into the details of what they are, um, they are dangerous by default. I mean, you don't necessarily want your system to be able to make a thousand copies of itself on somebody else's computer without necessarily controlling it. Um, so expand use cases and capabilities. Um, and the second piece is too that the, the this bill is specifically focused for making available for use in the context of international international trade, which will catch a lot of it, but it's not going to catch all of it, specifically open source and also R&D. So I know like, that there, it's understandable to want to give companies the ability to research and development without legislation. But the problem is, for the most advanced systems, once that system is built, it can be hacked and stolen and misused. Um, the accidents can happen at the RD stage. So R&D has to be included in the bill, um, as well as government and open source and uh, military as well. Um, Thank you. So I'm going to go on to a more philosophical question. I could maybe start with the Red Cross witnesses, and then anyone else that wants to comment would be great. We talked about uh, what essentially the West, Western democracies are trying to do to get together to try and have some sort of coordinated approach on how do we legislate and protect against harms. Um, but we're not the only players in the game. And we know that China and Russia in particular maybe Iran, are already spending enormous, enormous amounts of money on this. How do you deal with the issue that they operate from a very, I'll call it, different moral compass than we do in approaching these issues, whether it's about warfare or whether it's about just corporate things or individual privacy and freedom, deep fakes, all of those things that are starting to happen now? If I could start with uh, you yes, first. absolutely. I'm going to give the floor to Jonathan first and then happy yeah. to weigh in. Hi, thank you very much for, for that question. I think it's a very important one. One of the things that um, Catherine and I have both emphasized, um, and it goes back to a remark that was just made about a lack of legal frameworks, is that there actually are some legal frameworks that exist at the international level, in particular international humanitarian law, which puts limits on different means and methods of warfare, including um, ones that have been created now, ones that are emerging, and ones that will be created um, in the future. The reason why I mention this is that there may be questions around interpretation. There may be questions around compliance with international humanitarian law, depending on the context that you're dealing with or different actors that um, are being referred to. Um, but what doesn't change is that the rules remain set in stone and they're firm. There are going to be complications, of course, around different interpretations. Um, but there is a baseline. There is a de minimis um, set of rules uh, that the international community has agreed to, um, in particular when it regards uh, the use of artificial intelligence um, in situations of armed conflict, and that legal framework is international humanitarian law. So that's that's one response for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to add that, uh, fortunately, um, China is actually ahead of us in terms of AI regulation, and I think part of it is is the 
Uh, I mean, the Western democracies are afraid of losing control of the AI systems. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians are terrified because they, they depend on control. So if their system is not doing what they want it to do, if, if it's spitting out you know, non-party line, it's like they're more concerned about that than we are. So there, is, there are uh, mutual common ground areas with AI regulation, unfortunately. And, uh, any other witness? We have uh, Mr. Perkins, and we're already okay. uh, three <laughs> minutes over, but it was a fascinating three question, minutes. so I, I let it go. But. Uh,